we could think of ourselves as a bundle of feathers that are being cast to the wind, and grace only knows, God only knows, where the feathers are going to wind up. And that is, the, in some sense, the, the Christian narrative. If we put ourselves in God's hands, you never know, dot, dot, dot. You're listening to Echoes from the Bell Tower. Stories of wit and wisdom from Benedictine monks who live, work, and pray in southern Indiana. I'm Brother Colby. And I'm Brother Joel. St. Minard has a long history of monks who have made notable contributions to not only the church, but to science. One of the gifts of being a monk is that we are able to devote our full attention to our prayer and to our monastic assignments. We don't have a spouse or children to worry about. We don't have to worry about where our next meal will come from because of the generous gifts we receive from people who believe in our work. We are extremely grateful. We sat down with Archabbot Kurt Stasiak to talk about some of the achievements monks have made over the years. Part of being a monk at St. Mindred is kind of adding your name to a long list of people who have just made some amazing contributions to the church. Father Columba Kelly is a recent monk, probably most known for his work with chant. He oversaw the introduction of English into the celebration of the Divine Office and the Eucharist after Vatican II. He died in 2018. Father Damien Schmelz had a doctorate in plant ecology and is especially known for his research in old-growth forests in Indiana. He did so much work in plant ecology that an addition to the Donaldson's Woods Nature Preserve was dedicated in his honor. That's a contribution to the surrounding area that you would not expect from a monk. Father Damien died back in 2016. Back in the uh, late 1940s, 1950s, two of our monks, Father Conrad Lewis, Father Everard Olinger, worked together on translating the Psalter from Hebrew into English, and that became the English translation that is in the New American Bible, which is one of the main versions of the Bible that Catholics in the United States use. You know, without trying to be selfish, that's very much a, a St. Mindred contribution to the work of the Church at, at large. You can see this again and again throughout St. Mindred's history. Monks who have had the time to develop skills in a broad range of fields have made major contributions. Archbishop Kurt has one more example. Uh, one of the things I found out when I first came here in 1974, and this just stunned me, our Father Thomas Ostick, for a number of years, he was academic dean in our college, and he was president rector of our college for a couple of years. By training, he was a chemist. He had a doctorate in chemistry, and he was one of the chemists who was on the team developing the heat shield for Project Mercury back in the late 1950s, early 1960s, when we started sending satellites and rockets up. We just heard about monks who could have made the newspapers with their achievements, but on a daily basis, we have the opportunity to impact the lives of individual people in ways that might change that person's life, but would never make the news. As Father Garrick said in our episode opening, when we put ourselves in God's hands, you never know the places you'll go and the lives you'll touch. Here's Father Eugene with a story. I, I was recently at a parish in the East Coast where a woman came up to me and said, you're from St. Minard, to which I yes, I am. And she says, do you know Father so-and-so? Well, he had died by now, but I said, yeah, I did, I knew him. And she said, you know, when he was out here helping out one month, and my daughter, had gotten pregnant and was trying to figure out how she could have her baby and be in the church, and the pastor treated her like dirt. And she just happened to accidentally meet this Benedictine. And he treated her like gold, he said. And he, he, he said, well, I'll help you. If he won't, I'll help you. I'll figure out a way. And he did. And, of course, from that family, this monk could do no wrong. But you hear things... I never knew that. He never came back and never said anything about that. So nobody in-house would have known that ever happened. But I think there are varieties of ways that 
those kinds of things happen because our monks go out for a variety of things, you know, talks, helping out, social ministry. Perhaps the greatest impact St. Minor has had on people is through our seminary and school of theology. We have educated and formed a whole lot of people for the church, from priests, deacons, lay people, and even alumni of our One Bread, One Cup youth conference. People come to St. Minerid to learn, and then they take that knowledge out into the world. There's an amazing responsibility our teachers have. By teaching one person, they could potentially impact thousands over a lifetime. I had the privilege of, of teaching for 29 years in our School of Theology, and I remember somewhere during that period of time, one of my friends came up to me and and said, uh, you know, how many students do you have? And I said, well, you know, I'm teaching two courses right now. I've got 25 students in one course, and there's an elective I'm teaching that's got 15. And he goes, yeah, but, you know, you realize how many thousands and thousands of students you have, really? Not just in terms of the number of students you've had in the classroom over the years, but these guys go out and, and work as parish priests, and they teach their parishioners through their homilies, through classes. Some of them go on and get degrees on their own, and so they're teaching in schools. So that really kind of opened my mind to what it means to teach and, and the great opportunity we have had here at St. Mindred to, again, reach literally thousands of Catholics and Christians throughout the United States. Most of the monks we have talked about so far in this episode have served as teachers and administrators in our school. There is one recent monk who is known for bringing history to life in the classroom, but that's not all he will be remembered for. Here are three of his closest friends, Father Garrick, Father Harry, and Father Eugene, with an introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce one of the most outstanding monks in my community who passed away in 2015, Father Cyprian Davis. I experienced him as a, a humorous person with a deep, deep love of God and the church. He was a bookish, bright fellow. I think probably, a, you know, retiring, which is not uncommon for monks. Well, he was our first African-American monk and priest. He was a scholar. He was a very bright man, very methodical. He was not only known locally here as a great teacher, a mentor for many, but he really had an international reputation as both a medievalist and as an American historian of black Catholicism. And so it is by that reputation, I believe, that he will be uh, remembered, but we will always remember him, and I will always remember him as a beloved confrere, uh, a dear spiritual guide and confessor and teacher. Father Cyprian grew up in Washington, D.C., in a family of teachers. His father uh, taught physical education at Washington University, and his mother was a school teacher. There was also a relative whose name was Benjamin Davis, and he became the first black general in the United States. Father Cyprian was a big reader and was interested in history. He didn't grow up Catholic, but was impressed by the Catholic Church because it was the oldest. He became Catholic at 15 and was interested in monasticism from reading about monks. A friend encouraged him to ask some monasteries for information. And he wrote to a monastery, and this would have been in the 40s, and um, they encouraged him to join the Josephites, which was a religious group for African Americans doing lots of pastoral work. But Father Cyprian, he was set on becoming a monk. Many monasteries at that time did not accept African Americans, just as many dioceses did not accept black priests. When he died, uh, one of the things I took from his office for myself was a book of Thomas Merton's poems, which was given to him by mother and daddy Christmas 1949. 
Uh, and so he, wa he was very much focused. And his parents, though they were not Catholic, were certainly trying to be supportive and uh, helpful. Father Cyprian had a friend who was a professor at Catholic University of America, and one of her students was a monk. Father Gerard Elsperman, a monk of St. Meinrad, was at Catholic University studying uh, Greek patrology at that time, and uh, he evidently would go on and on about uh, how wonderful St. Manrid was. And so one of the people who knew him said, well, if St. Manrid is really so wonderful, what can you do for this young black Catholic who wants to become a monk? Is St. Manrid really willing to uh, accept uh, somebody who is not white? Father Gerard invited Cyprian to visit St. Manrid. Cyprian's first impressions were that the place weighed him down and he didn't like it here. But by the end of his visit, he had fallen in love with the place. There were already two other black brothers in the community at that time, but neither of them stayed. Abbot Ignatius invited Cyprian back to campus, and that showed him that African Americans were welcomed at St. Meinrad. After his first visit, Father Cyprian went back to Washington, D.C., and completed a year of study at Catholic University. In 1949, he returned to St. Minard and entered the Minor Seminary. He became the first African American to profess monastic vows and become a priest of St. Minard Archabbey. He also was followed somewhat closely by another African American, Father Boniface Hardin, and they were very much contrasts. Father Cyprian was very quiet, very methodical, very academically oriented. Father Boniface was totally charismatic, uh, was not educated much beyond what you would need to be for uh, priesthood in those days. And both of those monks had difficulty in this area in terms of pastoral work. They both had stories about being turned away at parishes and uh, that sort of thing. So there, there was that kind of issue that they had to deal with, but not in the monastery. We, we weren't very ideological, so they, they fit in like anybody else would, uh, would fit in. Father Cyprian believed Benedictines were scholars, and he filled that role well. He received his licentiate of sacred theology from the Catholic University of America. In the fall of 1958, he began studies for his licentiate and doctorate in historical sciences from Catholic University in Leuven, Belgium. Uh, he was writing a very, very extensive and long dissertation uh, associated with uh, medieval monasticism. He told me that he wrote the dissertation and he was sure that it wasn't good enough and so he kind of started over completely. And it, the dissertation was on the great monastery of Cluny, and it was about the people who belonged to the monastery who were not the monks, the family, and uh, people who lived around and in various ways uh, worked for, worked with, uh, in order to make the monastery uh, work. Since the monks of Cluny spent lots of time in church, they needed lots of people to help them with everything else. This was a turning point in Father Cyprian's life. This is when he learned how to be a historian. Between receiving his licentiate and doctorate, Father Cyprian returned to St. Meinrad to teach. It was 1963, and the country was in the full throes of the civil rights movement. When the uh, radical injustices that were becoming very well known during the 1950s and 60s began to surface, uh, he felt himself drawn more and more to the civil rights movement, as I mentioned earlier. Father Cyprian attended the March on Washington in 1963 and was in the crowd to hear Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech, calling for an end to racism. In 1965, he reached another turning point in his life when he attended the Selma to Montgomery March for Black Voting Rights. Martin Luther King Jr. put a call out to clergy from all over the United States to come to Selma and Abbot Bonaventure gave permission to any of the monks who wished to go. 
You know, the march to Selma, I don't know, certainly that event made it clear that you could not be a black man, uh, a black priest, a black monk in the United States and not somehow be touched by that. And, and it was a kind of a call to do something. And so his vocation as the historian of black Catholics kind of grows out of that and becomes kind of his response. What can I do? I'm a historian. I'm a medieval historian. As a black Catholic professor of church history, Father Cyprian began getting requests to speak, and people would ask him about the history of black Catholics. He had been to America Catholic Historical Association, and while he was there, he was told that it was tragic that there was no documentation on the history of black Catholics. He began to realize the need for and the importance of the research that would become his life's work. In 1975, Father Cyprian returned to Leuven to work on his doctorate. To get the doctorate, he had to defend his thesis on the history of the lay brother. He also had to have a supplementary thesis on an unrelated topic. He threw himself into researching the history of black Catholics. He picked that topic and uh, started working on it and then discovered that the black Catholics in the U.S. had made a terrific impact in a variety of ways that had not been recorded, that had not been researched, and that had gone literally unnoticed. And so all of a sudden, it moved from a secondary concern to his principal concern. His understanding, he had come to St. Minder to be a monk and to kind of to, to do this a wonderful search for God, and yet at the time he was living, all of a sudden he finds himself, because of his own race, drawn into this kind of larger movement. And then, as a historian, finds himself called upon in small ways, but making it clear to him that, that he is somebody who can tell these people uh, about their history and to show them that black Catholics have a very specific and ancient identity in the American church. But the interesting thing about Father Cyprian was he had exactly what was needed at that time for that movement, which was somebody that could articulate its history somebody who could look at it and bring it all together and show it as uh, a work and, and what it really was. And hardly anybody else would have been in a position to do that as he was, because not only did he have the experience of his own life, but he also had the academic background and all the skills that went into that. And so his life was totally changed by that work that he was doing in the history of black Catholics. Father Cyprian received a grant from the Lilly Foundation to publish a book on his research. His book, The History of Black Catholics in the United States, was published in 1990. From that moment on, everything he did in his life was basically some kind of a reflection of outgrowth, focus on the history of black Catholics in uh, America, and of course, all of those many black Catholics sang his praises because finally their story was being told. And not only being told, but being told well. Well, Cyprian is really remembered for opening up the history of black Catholics, which most everybody was completely clueless about. And uh, showing that Black Catholics' place in American Catholicism was ancient, uh, and that there had been important and significant people who had made a contribution not only to their race, but to the church in general, and uh, that this put them into this kind of large Catholic universal church, and that they belonged there. Nationwide, Father Cyprian will be remembered for his research on the history of black Catholics, but in and around St. Meinrad, he'll also be known as a good teacher. 
Father Garrick, Father Harry, and Father Eugene were all students of Father Cyprian's long before they became colleagues and friends. They said he was introverted, but as a teacher he became animated and dramatic. He drew his students into the narrative of history through portraits of people. And um, he had developed a method of teaching where he taught history around personalities, not around events. And so it, he had the ability and, and the showmanship to make that all come alive. And uh, if you'd ask a lot of priests, they would probably indicate that uh, he was famous because he was, kept me interested in history when nobody else could. And, and he could do that. He was, he was a masterful teacher from that, uh, that angle. During his life, Father Cyprian authored six books and dozen of articles, book chapters, and encyclopedia entries. He received numerous awards and several honorary doctorates, but he was not interested in titles and awards. What he was interested in was the impact he was making in the lives of students, because I think he thought his students would then go on to be able to pass their information and their knowledge on to other students, and that that would help to change the culture we live in for the better. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this episode about Father Cyprian. Our next episode that we'll release in two weeks will be about students ministering out in our local communities. I hope you tune in. Today's episode was edited and produced by Krista Hall with the help of Brother Joel Blaze, Brother Colby Wolnikowski, Mary Jean Schumacher, Jim Paquette, Tammy Sheeter, and Christian Mozek. The music for this podcast was written and produced by Brother Joel. Thanks to Archabbot Kurt Stasiak, Father Garrick DeBona, Father Eugene Hensel, and Father Harry Hagen. Thanks also to Ruth Ings, who interviewed Father Cyprian in 2005 for her book, Conversations in the Abbey. That interview was a valuable resource while working on this episode. If you are enjoying Echoes from the Bell Tower, tell your friends and subscribe to it on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite listening platform. You can also help us out by leaving a rating or review in iTunes. You can find all of our past podcast episodes, as well as some pictures of Father Cyprian, at stminerad.edu slash echoes. Go check them out. The funniest story that I loved to tell when he was president and he hated it was uh, he taught us monastic history. And in those days, we didn't have very many monastic classrooms. So we were stuck in the basement in this god-awful room. It wasn't clean or anything. It was almost like a coal bin. But that was the way you did it in those days. So we were doing our history and he was there and he was lecturing away and he liked to pride himself on being courageous and strong and brave. And uh, a mouse walked in that room, maybe three inches at best. And I pointed out, you know, Father Cyprian, look at this. Well, he panicked. I mean, he jumped up on a chair, which if you knew Father Cyprian, he was not what you'd call most athletic person. So all of a sudden, he started moving and jumped up on a chair, yelled and screamed. And this poor mouse didn't know what to do, but it wouldn't run away. It just ran around the chair. And we were howling and about falling on the floor at the time. And eventually, the mouse ran out. And then Father Cyprian came back and said, well, I guess I fixed that. <laughs> he didn't fix anything. But uh, he hates that story, or he hated it. But uh, he sees himself as, you know, really tough and strong. Yeah, as long as you don't have to run up against a mouse.